Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining and welcome to today's Data Talk session of GeoPath's Out of Home Office Hours. Uh, again, just want to say thank you, and we really appreciate everybody joining today. This is Scott Fiaschetti from GeoPath, and uh, I'm here with uh, Brian Schaffer and AJ Chaffee from GeoPath, as always, helping out in the background. But uh, today, we're really excited to have with us uh, Jay Walker-Smith, who's uh, Chief Knowledge Officer for Brand and Marketing for uh, the Consulting Division of Kantar. Uh, Walker has co-authored several books. He's also a marketing news columnist. He's a video blogger. He's a public radio commentator and has received many, many uh, awards throughout his career, including recently uh, the 2020 AMA Charles uh, Coolidge Harlan Award for Outstanding Contributions in the Field of Market Research. So um, we're truly honored and excited to have Walker with us today. I just want to say thank you and give, uh, give Walker a chance to, to say hi before I talk a little bit more about what we're uh, going to be talking about today. Howdy. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. And so, um, as I said, we're really excited about this presentation. Walker is going to talk through um, and help give us a sense in the out of home industry uh, what we can expect as consumers and brands move through this this pandemic and move into this post pandemic marketplace. So I'm going to hand it off to to Walker. I'm going to stop sharing and he'll share his screen. But as we're doing that, I just want to talk about um, a couple housekeeping things. So feel free to ask questions right along as you like. We're going to have a Q&A after, uh, after the presentation. So, but, but that said, please feel free to use the, the, the question widget within the Zoom platform to, to ask questions. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to track those in the chat, so we ask that you do that in the, the Q&A session to ensure we get to everybody's questions or as many questions as we can. With that, um, I'll stop talking and hand it off to uh, Walker. Thanks very much, Scott. So just confirm for me that you can uh, see my uh, first slide here and then we'll be good to go. I definitely can. Perfect, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of your agenda today and thanks everybody for taking a little time out of your uh, afternoon. For those of you not familiar with Kantar, just a very quick sentence. We're one of the world's largest consulting and research firms. We do a lot of different things, but one of our primary areas of focus is trends and futures. And in that vein, today, what I'd like to do is share a quick overview of our framework for figuring out what will change and what will stay the same in this post-pandemic marketplace. So I'm going to focus on kind of some big overarching dynamics affecting the marketplace, uh, and then consider what some of those implications might be as we begin to consider what the new and not new marketplace of tomorrow is going to look at. But before I jump into that, one quick reminder, Kantar has been publishing a steady stream of publicly accessible updates on the impact of the coronavirus uh, across categories uh, around the world. It's a lot of white papers, webinars, tracking results, media analyses, purchase panel modeling, health sector reports, you name it. And you can find it all under the inspiration tab of our website. So please uh, visit there if you'd like a little more detail. And just one other thing, a little advertisement for myself. On Wednesday, October 28th at noon Eastern time, I'm going to be doing one of my regular Future View webinars. I do these two or three times a year. And this one will be a more detailed exploration of some of the second and third order effects of the kind of disruptions that we've been facing as a result of this pandemic. Registration is free, so keep checking the website for the link. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these ideas here uh, today. So where do we get started? Well, you know, there is uh, this perception uh, among lots of us, um, perhaps many of you, that uh, change is going to affect everything. It's a common reaction in the heat of the moment. Change seems to be all around, and so we expect change to be all around tomorrow as well. And indeed, the universal presumption of business leaders worldwide in our recent Kantar Compass survey is that consumer behavior is going to change. But consumers themselves aren't so sure. In our COVID-19 barometer, which has been tracking attitudes through the pandemic across 50 countries worldwide, we're up to wave eight now, consumers are split right down the middle. 
So our planning assumptions should not be change in everything. And indeed, we know from past disruptions that much of what we think at the time is soon forgotten like a New Year's resolution. So we need a more nuanced framework to figure out what will change and what will not change or what will be new and what will not be new. There is one thing we do know from past disruptions, and that is that when consumers are faced with confusing and anxious situations, they tend to turn back to things they know rather than take a leap into the great unknown. And that's the word to remember, disruptions. We've had them before. In fact, we've had three black swan events just since the turn of this century, 9-11, 2008, and now 2020. And I would argue, in fact, that disruptions have been frequent enough to be almost a normal part of doing business these days. And we can learn from them. You see one big lesson here. The yellow line in this chart is from our global brand Z tracking of brand value. And we track about 165,000 or so brands worldwide. And our tracking shows that after the financial crisis, strong familiar brands did best. They did best than many other indices that include other kinds of brands, both during the crisis and afterwards, these stronger brands recovered faster and had higher performance um, uh, afterwards. So it, it is strong, familiar, established things that people are turning to. These results, in fact, have been echoed by an Edelman survey in March, which found that 60% of consumers across the 12 markets they surveyed agreed that during this pandemic, they are turning more and more to brands that they can, quote, absolutely trust. So no matter how it's measured, during a disruption, people turn to what they know, not to what they don't know. People look for something that feels familiar. It's something that's the same, not different. And irrespective of any other business considerations, that in and of itself is going to pump the brakes on speeding off towards change. Similarly, we've all read recent news stories about comfort foods, and it's the same phenomenon. People want things they know, things that don't involve risk or exposure, things that resonate deeply at an emotional and cultural level. As I like to put it, people don't aspire to the new normal. They want to get back to normal. So it's no surprise that people are reacting in ways that are self-protective and indulgent. Now, that said, this pandemic is unprecedented in many ways, and we can get a better sense of what's going on by looking at how consumers have responded during past disruptions, not just at the kind of reactive attitudes and behaviors we're measuring right now. And this is our framework for understanding change during disruptions. So if there is one slide to screenshot, uh, this would be it. In this framework, we've distilled what we've seen in past disruptions, big ones, little ones, internal to a category, external to a category, fast moving, slow moving, you name it. We've distilled what we've seen in past disruptions in this chart. And based on the past, we know that change for any particular category or brand can range from nothing to everything. And what determines the amount of change is which of these three principles or operating dynamics is shaping the future in any given sector. So here's how it works. You start by looking to see if the disruption has made existing business models unviable or unworkable or irretrievably unprofitable. And if so, the acceleration principle on the right applies. The current marketplace will be swept clean, clearing the way for emerging trends or brands to rapidly take hold and dominate. But if business models are still profitable and still work, then the next question to ask is whether the old normal has deep cultural connections with people's lives and values. And if so, then the new Coke principle here on the left applies, which is just the idea that what's new oftentimes reminds people how much they like the old, the old stuff they were kind of taking for granted, which is exactly what happened with new Coke back in 1985. And if this principle applies, then the future will be more like the old than like anything new. But if all things are the same with culture, the amount of change we will see will be an asymmetric function of the quality of the experience people have with the new thing that has been brought in by the disruption. If it's a good quality experience, a lot of people will change. If it's a bad experience, few people will change. It's all a matter of quality. 
In fact, we know this intimately. Virtual meetings like this are fine and good, but in oftentimes they're not great. They work for some things, but not for all things. So in the future, we'll use virtual systems where they work, but for everything else, at the first chance we get, we'll go back to the kinds of meetings we held before. So in this way, the future of meetings is asymmetric or mixed. So let's think about using this three-part framework to identify three big overarching dynamics we will see going forward. And let's start with something related to New Coke. By this dynamic, we expect that there will be a comeback of all things human scale or people rushing back even recklessly to reconnect socially and in person. Now, mind you, there have been huge gains by e-commerce during the pandemic. McKinsey says it's 10 years worth that occurred in eight weeks, but e-commerce is already giving back some of these gains, as you can see from our Shopperscape tracking data here on the left. And one quarter say they'll shop more online post-pandemic. That's a lot of people, but it's far from everybody. In fact, eight and 10 in our monitor data shown on the right say they prefer in-person grocery shopping. So human scale has deep cultural relevance. It's kind of like old Coke. In our US monitor tracking, we find that about one third of people have had online celebrations of life events they would normally have had in person. But as you can see on the right, nearly half have found these online versions to be a poor substitute. McKinsey also has reported that in their tracking of consumers in Italy, 60% shopped online during the lockdowns there, but fewer than 10% found the experience to be satisfying. In fact, the number one thing people told us very early on that was the hardest thing to give up because of the lockdowns and the pandemic was social interaction. And this was mirrored in other answers about leaving the house and freedom and flexibility. It all added up to their number one loss, social interaction. Indeed, the things that people tell us in our US monitor research shown here on the left, that they are ready to do again as soon as they can, it's those four red bars at the top, are all activities for which the sole purpose or at least a big part of it is human scale face-to-face -face connection. Now this has lots of implications. For example, the chart on the right is one we use to illustrate the future brick and mortar retail. The green in the middle is stuff or merchandise. The yellow on the side is services or people. Online is winning on merchandise, especially post pandemic. So brick and mortar will have to deliver more services or more face-to-face -face time with other people. And that's the shift you see in the size of the yellow area that contrasts the past with the future. Indeed, this desire for social connection is seen in many ways. For example, the Washington Post reported recently that, you know, one night stands are still a thing. For many people, as the Post reporter wrote, the need for human connection is worth the potential exposure to the coronavirus. Human scale has deep cultural relevance. Indeed, the head of public health in Hong Kong was quoted recently as saying, it is impossible to keep restricting people's movements until the virus is fully contained. The desire to connect face to face is just too strong. So notwithstanding a spike in cases at the time that uh, the head of uh, public health made this statement, Hong Kong was relaxing some of the measures it had put in place. We see the very same phenomenon going on here with schools reopening and this irresistible push over the past several weeks to return to bars and restaurants. The tug of social connection is going to make it harder to bring the virus under control, but this is the reality. So human scale, it has deep cultural connections and everything related to social engagement will endure. Before the pandemic, before the pandemic, there was already pushback against digitally overloaded lives. All we had to do was look up from our screens to see that all around us, media headlines notwithstanding, analog culture was thriving in the midst of a digital revolution. Record numbers of farmers markets, cafe culture, coffee shop culture, food truck culture, festivals and urban greenways, buy local, vinyl LPs and physical books making a comeback. 
Online and e-commerce have made gains during the pandemic and much of that will persist, but people still want human contact and social engagement and no amount of digital can satisfy that. Just like always, human scale will be a big part of the next normal. But human scale does pose challenges and risk in the midst of a pandemic. There's no holding it back, even when the consequences have mortal risk. We can see what this means in terms of the pandemic itself. Historians of past epidemics note that there is no such thing as a clean end to an epidemic or pandemic. It's messy. So they distinguish between the social end and the outbreak end. And I've added the economic end. In broad strokes, this pandemic chronology lays out what the marketplace has yet to go through in order to get back on trend. The social end of the coronavirus pandemic has begun already. Cabin fever has broken the thermometer. Social connection is increasing, risk notwithstanding, and that will create a division between COVID clusters and COVID bubbles, which is a divide overlaid on top of existing divides of income, race, age, geography, different sectors of the economy, different types of jobs, different levels of vulnerability to the worst effects of COVID-19. An early social end, which we are experiencing, means a later outbreak end, and thus changes we have undertaken in behavioral norms and the design of interior spaces will become permanent, just as they did in past pandemics. More hand washing and less hand shaking, if you will. The economic end will have to await the outbreak end, but should follow quickly thereafter. However, the length of time to get there will be difficult for many businesses and even for some categories. So we will see a recovery, but not a restoration of what we had before. We'll have to build value and innovation on new platforms that leverage new kinds of adjacent possibilities. In other words, the sources of value in many categories will have to be reconstituted, not simply recovered. So how long will this last, you ask? Well, the healthcare practice of McKinsey just published a set of scenarios about this timeline a week ago. The most likely case by their calculations is the very end of next year to get to the outbreak end. And the odds that we will have to wait longer than that are greater than the odds that we might get there sooner than that. Now, remember, the news changes every day. Just this week, we heard that both AstraZeneca and J&J &J are getting close to a vaccine. Yet researchers also announced this week that they've discovered that the coronavirus is mutated in a way that makes it even more contagious to the point that mask and social distancing might be less effective as preventive measures. I think the key takeaway is that we just don't know, so we shouldn't take anything for granted. The social end is here already, but the outbreak end is not yet clearly in sight. Which brings us then to the question of how long consumers expect this to go on. As you see in this chart, people in the US are all over the board. A plurality think one year, but one fifth don't know, and another fifth think two years or more. Or to put this another way, consumers are getting no consistent, reliable guidance about what to expect. And this means that the marketplace is being buffeted by a wide variety of plans and expectations. There is no single thread or unifying dynamic shaping consumer attitudes. Consumers are both uncertain about the duration of these challenges, and for the most part, not very optimistic about what they are facing for the next few years. And so unsurprisingly, this makes business as usual impossible. Now the progression I've just outlined includes a new regime of social safeguards, and these will endure. They're not a fad or a mere necessity of the moment. Our US monitor data show that most people expect things like mass to become a permanent part or a part of normal life. And half of parents say teaching good hygiene will be an important life lesson to pass along. We know from past pandemics that permanent changes in norms and spaces are to be expected. The small collection of things you see here are design features of homes and commercial spaces that originated in measures to limit contagion during past pandemics. 
you know, the typical person is either forgotten or really didn't know to begin with where these things came from. But once they were adopted, they didn't go away just because the disease came under control. And that's a lesson from the past that we can apply today. What look to be temporary measures to adjust to the characteristics of the virus will actually turn out to be permanent elements of life to come. And the main reason for this, of course, is so that people can get back to human scale. And that's one of the nuances of the new coat principle. Sometimes it takes a change or a shift to preserve something bigger that people want to retain or return to. Now, what this means for our post-pandemic life at home is speculative, but Dahlin, a global architectural firm, has drawn some suggested floor plans to illustrate the new sorts of spaces we might be occupying, such as flex garages or germ-resistant flooring and countertops, or home offices, or bigger lobbies and touchless controls and drop zones for packages and clothing, or a quarantine suite over the garage instead of a mother-in-law suite, or wider trails for socially distanced passing of other pedestrians. And these kinds of measures will have second order effects of their own. The first prediction that I made in February when 20 seconds of hand washing first became a thing was that the cold and flu remedies aisle in the drugstore was gonna take a big hit this year. And sure enough, the World Health Organization has figures showing that the Southern Hemisphere has now been through its winter flu season with almost no cases of the flu. The social end makes the outbreak in harder for the coronavirus, but the associated social safeguards may have the opposite effect on other diseases. Remember, the biggest challenge of the coronavirus is how contagious it is. The flu isn't nearly as contagious. So social safeguards may not completely contain a highly contagious disease, but the safeguards put in place may be all it takes to bring a halt to a less contagious disease. Which brings us then to the second principle of asymmetry, which portends a new reality of greater risk aversion that will play out in asymmetric ways. It will have an impact on how people spend. Overcoming a new and more pronounced fear of risk exposure is going to require that we as businesses lean into the task of reassuring consumers about engaging in the marketplace. Now, admittedly, there has been some diminishment of concern and worry about the virus. Our COVID-19 barometer tracking for the U.S. shows that since April, there has been a slight decrease in concern. But concern is still widespread, with one-third highly concerned. And this is mirrored in CDC data making the headlines lately about mental health and anxiety. And it's not just the CDC. A Census Bureau survey found the same thing. As the pandemic lockdown settled in, more people were reporting days when they felt depressed. One indication of the concern people have are the things they say are needed for them to return to normal life, cabin fever notwithstanding. Top of the list is a vaccine. That's the outbreak end, and only that gets us to the economic end. Just to drill down on this a little bit, this is a timeline of our U.S. monitor tracking of risk aversion. It's the dark blue line. Just after the financial crisis, people were playing it safe, and it took until 2015 for most people to be willing to really engage with the marketplace again. But now risk aversion has returned. And as you can see, it is at the highest level we have measured since we began tracking it during the financial crisis. Of course, it's not everybody, which we can see in crowded bars and restaurants, but it is far and away most people, which we can see in the lack of enough people crowding into bars and restaurants to keep them from going under and closing. The aggregate impact of risk aversion is a loss of critical mass that is needed for business models to work. The worst sort of risk aversion is something economists refer to as psychological scarring. It is a well-known effect of big economic disruptions, and it has a corresponding impact on the speed and strength of economic recovery. You saw it in the chart I just showed you. After the meltdown of 2008 for consumers as a whole, scarring didn't really heal until 2015. 
A recent paper modeling what this phenomenon might mean after the coronavirus pandemic predicts a drop in consumer engagement and spending to the tune of a 5% reduction in GDP that will persist for years to come. The reason is that going through a disruption causes people to overestimate the likelihood that something similar will occur again soon. Our U.S. monitor data show this clearly. Nearly everyone thinks there will be another pandemic within the next five years. But these are rare events, not just pandemics, but any sort of black swan. The last pandemic, even close to this one, was more than half a century ago. Yet the overhang of this worry is likely to depress spending for many years. Now, this is not to say that people will avoid the marketplace only that they will be overcautious and will thus spend far less than they might otherwise be able to afford. People will be harder to persuade, fewer people will engage fully, businesses will have to work harder and invest more to get people to spend, borrow, and take chances. However, the good news is that this is a psychological phenomenon, so businesses can address it. Somebody's got to reassure the public, and it sure doesn't seem like any level of government is going to do that. So companies will have to provide this sort of reassurance and encouragement if they are to unlock the pent-up desire to get back to normal. And this means an opportunity to bring people back faster, but it also means more investment in marketing and advertising, and frankly, in innovation, too. We'll see risk aversion play out in several asymmetrical ways. The first is a little bit more maker culture, particularly to reduce exposure to disruptions or to supplement gaps in protection and resources. Now, maker culture, as you know, was already a big trend pre-COVID. It's this subculture of people who create things for themselves, often as a form of craft, but more often as a means of self-reliance. But as the pandemic unfolded, maker culture found mainstream appeal as individual people rallied to support healthcare workers by handcrafting face masks and 3D printing ventilators and plastic shields. There is a growing presumption that this sort of innovation is what saved many lives by filling in the gaps that large scale manufacturing could not meet. Many people became makers during this pandemic they're the ones who were able to make a difference where and when it mattered. Now, obviously, not everyone is going to become a maker, but this sort of thing arose as a response to risk and needs in the marketplace, and in doing so, it has brought more people into this arena. But this doesn't mean that big companies don't need to be makers themselves. They might have been behind the curve for emergency needs during the pandemic, but increasingly, consumers expect companies to play a sort of quote unquote maker role in society at large, meaning that people expect companies to take on problems and needs that have traditionally been the purview of government. Now, this is a radical shift in what consumers expect from brands and businesses. There's a long history behind this shift, but in summary, you know, broadly speaking, the first half of the 20th century was the product era. The material abundance we enjoy today didn't exist, so people were focused on accumulating things. Brands sold stuff. After World War II, this began to shift, particularly with the value changes of the 60s. It was no longer just about the product. It was now about the person, the person buying the product. Product is a pathway to a better self, personalization of individual wants and preferences. But as we have turned the corner on the 21st century, expectations have changed again. Product and person are now taken for granted. People want brands to do more. They want brands and companies to play a public role and to contribute to a better society. Now, this began with attitudes about sustainability, but it has taken on new urgency over the past several months. Not just the pandemic, but the racial justice protest and the record-setting numbers of wildfires in the West and tropical storms in the Atlantic. Even more importantly, this is the mindset of millennials who now constitute the very core of the consumer marketplace. This generation has grown up with these expectations, so to ensure their loyalty and frankly to attract their talent, companies will have to embrace this commitment as well. Emblematic of this shift 
is the action taken last year by the Business Roundtable to change its mission from a focus only on shareholders to one inclusive of all stakeholders. This is about society and the public, but it's also a paradox because few business leaders really know how to run a company on behalf of all stakeholders. Their schooling and experience are about shareholders. So we are all learning as we go, but there is no going back in everything. People are looking for commercial enterprises to live up to the new expectations of the era of the public. But risk aversion has other manifestations as well. Heightened risk aversion will spill over into every domain. For example, I suspect we'll see even more innovation when it comes to insurance. Before the pandemic, we were already seeing innovations in insuring people against risk associated with, say, riding in a driverless car. And NEOS, a UK insurance company, was adding smart home technologies to its policies. They will insure your home, but first you have to take steps to minimize risk by installing smart systems. And there are even insurance companies around the world that let you turn the policy on and off using your mobile device so you can insure yourself as needed or as not needed on an on-demand basis. And there are insurance policies to protect you for the dumb things you posted online in years past, as well as insurance for legal assistance if you're being bullied online. It is only a matter of time before we see more options for more things as our lives are changed even more by the new realities of the coronavirus. And we will also see more interest in things that are intimate and close and not remote. Such things are more familiar and they feel less exposed to disruptions. They also feel safer and less risky. Indeed, the pandemic may well have been the final nail in the coffin of globalism, at least physical flows across borders like goods and people. Information flows are different, but physical flows have been shown by the pandemic to be risky and subject to unexpected interruption. Globalism, of course, has been under pressure for a long time. It's not just the rise of Trump and Johnson and Erdogan. IP disputes, immigration issues, and job losses have been growing concerns for a while. Local was already a big trend in response to that, and now it is bigger than ever. In our COVID-19 barometer tracking, we find that most U.S. consumers prefer local goods, and even more are not in favor of goods from China. And as high as the preference for localism among U.S. consumers, it is much higher among Chinese consumers. So it goes both ways, local. And finally, I want to say something uh, related to risk aversion about the next generation, Gen Z. We've done a lot of pioneering generational work at Kantar. There's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion in much of the generational analysis out there. So you have to sort through it carefully. The proper way to understand generations is in terms of starting points. The trajectory of every generational cohort begins, begins amid an amalgamation of economic, demographic, and cultural realities that shape expectations and open or close various avenues of opportunity. Over time, different generations often wind up in the very same place and look very much alike, but each has taken a different trajectory to get there because each began with a different formative starting point. The story of generations is the story of trajectories, not outcomes, which means that generational analysis is all about starting points. A generational cohort is the aggregation of individual trajectories that begin at a similar point in time and thus share a common starting point. Generations are defined and differentiated by their starting points, and this will be especially true for Gen Z. There has been a lot of economic research into generational starting points, and curiously, most of it is concerned the trailing edge of the baby boomer generation, those born in the early 1960s as the fertility boom that defined baby boomers was coming to an end. Economist Lisa Kahn of Rochester and formerly of Harvard has done some groundbreaking work that found trailing boomers who graduated college during the Reagan recession suffered a lifetime earnings penalty. They started out making less money and they have never been able to close the gap. Another study found that these same graduates also suffer from much worse health outcomes and thus they have higher mortality rates. Their lives have also been more chaotic in terms of family structure. These generational starting points last a lifetime. 
In fact, a slightly younger cohort that came of age during the high gasoline prices caused by the 1979 Iran oil embargo now drive much less and use public transportation much more than those who came of age during lower gasoline prices. Starting points matter for a lifetime. And for Gen Z, the leading edge, not the trailing edge, as you see here, is coming of age during a significant economic downturn. And that's important because the sensibility of any generation is really set by its leading edge. Boomers had the leading edge advantage of prosperity in the 1960s, and this set its lifelong sensibility. Gen Z is not as lucky as that. And Gen Z faces some multipliers that will further disadvantage them. There is a well-known rise in anxiety, depression, and suicide among young people. We've seen that already. Recent headlines have attributed this to the pandemic, and that's not correct. This has been a growing problem for many years. The pandemic has worsened it, didn't cause it. Another recent study looked at trust as a function of having lived through an epidemic or a pandemic. This study did a detailed matching across nearly 140 countries of survey research respondents to Gallup World Polls conducted between 2006 and 2018, and they matched it against epidemics and pandemics going back to 1970. This study found that high exposure to an epidemic or pandemic during the formative years of 18 to 25 means lower trust in government decades later. Starting points create lifetime effects. But the advantage for Gen Z is that this sort of disconnection puts them on the cusp of change. And they have grown up during a period of time when there is more change in social attitudes than any time since the 1960s. After decades of little change, Attitudes and values about things ranging from same-sex marriage to Me Too to sustainability to racial justice have changed dramatically in the 20 years since the turn of the 21st century. It's worth noting that the change in values during the 60s was toward individuality, while the change in values today is toward conscience and community. It's very different. And Gen Z has the opportunity ahead of it to be a powerful agent of social change. They have less to lose economically and politically and everything to gain culturally and communally. They have a clean slate. And it's a clean slate in more ways than that, to kind of make a bad pun. It brings us to the final dynamic, one that will accelerate into the new normal, and that is hygiene which will definitely be a permanent feature of the marketplace ahead. Now, early on, we asked U.S. consumers how they expected their spending might change after the pandemic. And top of the list were things related to hygiene and disinfecting. Now, obviously, asking consumers to predict their future behavior is a fraught exercise during the best of times, much less in the middle of a global pandemic. But it does provide an indication of what's on people's minds. Combined with what we just discussed in terms of risk aversion, it's not unreasonable to expect that this will be a big part of the future. As a matter of fact, hygiene is the number one concern we have seen in all of our survey tracking and social listening data throughout this pandemic. But there are a few other ways we see the importance of hygiene, which reinforce and validate what we're hearing from consumers in our other work. On the left is a summary chart from an extensive analysis by our team in China of what sold and what didn't sell during and after the lockdowns there. The upper right are things that did well during the lockdowns, and it's almost all hygiene-related products. The lower right are things that did well after the lockdowns, and while other things made a comeback, hygiene-related products remained above average. In the middle are summary reports from our global network of on the ground cultural experts, we call them streetscapers, who can tell us what's going on in different cities or markets around the world. And no matter the city, when we ask what would be most important post pandemic in that region of the world, it was hygiene above all else. And the charts on the right come from the Financial Times. They show the plummeting use of paper currency in the UK because people are afraid that touching money will expose them to the coronavirus. And the coin shortage in the US is due in no small part to this as well. What's needed is a hygiene perimeter. 
that will give consumers enough confidence to return to the marketplace. It's just like the situation after 9-11. People were afraid to fly, so TSA was created to establish a security perimeter beyond which people would feel safe enough to get back to business as usual. And it worked. And that's what's needed again. We need to signal hygiene so that people will feel safe enough to get back to business as usual. As I like to say, hygiene is the new digital of tomorrow because everything will have to pass muster on hygiene before anything else can take place. Behaviors get changed by new norms and new designs for physical spaces, and we'll see a lot of that to restore confidence. But confidence can also be restored by signaling hygiene. And there will be more and more of such signaling to come, especially when it comes to people's homes. <clears throat> homes will be a bigger part of the landscape, so hygiene will matter even more around the house, just as it will be more important everywhere. One big implication of this involves the fabrics that we wear, and soon enough, the fabrics around the house as well. Masks have been controversial, but masks are going to be a new platform of innovation, and not just to make them fashionable. Antiviral snoods are on the market now. They're made from fibers that block viruses, and they offer advantages in fit and breathability. It's very easy to imagine that these kinds of fabrics will be used for other things, like home furnishings, as we look ahead to the future. Before the pandemic, we were already seeing clothing companies incorporating antimicrobial fibers that are made from silver and copper. And this is our clothing of tomorrow. These are our home fabrics of tomorrow as well. And why not even something like, say, home building materials? Consumers are soon going to be asking why they have to clean up these microscopic threats. Why can't they be prevented or blocked in the first place? And we're going to see more of that. Indeed, one thing to use will be sensors, not just to do something like, say, make homes smarter or make ourselves smarter, but to make homes and ourselves more hygienic. We will see more monitoring devices as all, of all sorts. Now, admittedly, monitoring and sensors in the form of contact tracing apps have not had any success during this pandemic. They're new, they haven't been well supported, and they raise privacy concerns. But this sort of technology will get better and more widely accepted, and it won't necessarily impinge on privacy. Nor will it just be about the coronavirus. Air quality tracking systems are already in use, and they provide guidance about where to go or not go, and when it is safe to be outside. And these sorts of technologies will find more applications in a world increasingly driven by hygiene. Indeed, for the past decade, we at Kantar have been sermonizing to clients in every category that health is no longer a category or a benefit unto itself. It is now integral to every category and a benefit of all products. And this is just true everywhere you look. Home is going to take on even more importance as people become more homebound. And as a corollary to that, staying at home means less driving. Now, this could be a lot of change or a little change, but I'm going to bet we see a lot of change. And by that, I mean lifestyles remade around the home in the same way that lifestyles were remade around the car, particularly after World War II. Think of how much of our lives and commerce is car-centric drive throughs C-stores, mall parking lots, commutes to the office, click and collect, omni-channel, big box stores, strip malls, suburbs, two-car garages, vacation homes, driving trips, retirement RVs, you name it. Just about everything is car-centric. Even to get to the train or an airport, you have to drive a car. If people feel that home is the only hygienic place where they can live with freedom from worry about hazards and risk, then home will dominate more and more of people's lives. Cars won't go away, but they could easily go away just enough to affect businesses at the margins where we earn most of our profits. To begin with, home is seen as a haven. The recently published America at Home study found that the number one thing people, <clears throat> excuse me, the number one thing that people associate with home as a result of the coronavirus pandemic is the idea of safety. 
Home is a place of protection and security, and thus it is the place to do everything in a sheltered and shielded way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, going to other places involves exposure to risk, but home doesn't involve those risks. So instead of going to other places, people can protect themselves by staying at home and letting those services and products come to them. This is the homebound culture that people are becoming accustomed to during this pandemic. We're in the middle of a mass forced experiment. This is not something that all businesses and all people would ever have done voluntarily. It has taken the external threat of the coronavirus. But now that it has happened, people are discovering new things that will accelerate changes in their lifestyles and work styles. And working from home is one of the biggest ways, if not the primary way, in which home could become central and displace driving at the margins. Our US monitor data finds that nearly everybody is positive about the shift to working from home. Now, there are lots of challenges to it, but on the whole, people have found it positive. <clears throat> but the attitudes of workers are not what will determine the future of home or the future of the workplace. Instead, it's productivity data, not whether workers like it. Corporate management wants to know if it can get the job done without the expense of an office. And initial reports, a couple of which are shown here, document measurable significant productivity gains. And the Upwork study at the bottom finds that business leaders intend to make a bigger commitment to working from home as their businesses emerge from this pandemic. This is the future. Working from home was an emerging trend, but it is now being accelerated into a big trend for tomorrow. Of course, all kinds of business leaders have mixed opinions. Some are bullish, some are standoffish. The Wall Street Journal recently did an interesting comparison of opinions among prominent CEOs. Mark Zuckerberg and Hayward Donegan are at one extreme, Jamie Dimon and Reed Hastings at the other. But most are somewhere in the middle, and that's the future something in the middle. The impact will be at the margins, but that doesn't mean a minor impact. <clears throat> this is a chart from a report issued by the Greater Washington DC Partnership about the future plans of employers in that area. As you can see, even as late as next summer, employers in the area from Baltimore to Richmond do not plan on having 100% of their workforce back on site. And this varies a lot between small and large businesses, with large companies planning to bring back the smallest percentage. The impact of a home-centered life will have a big effect on cars. I borrowed this table from a KPMG report that has estimated the likely decline in vehicle miles travel based on likely scenarios about working from home. Driving is going to take a hit. Cars won't disappear, of course, but we will be spending a lot less time behind the wheel. And even at the margins, this has big implications. At Kantar, we do a lot of work in the automotive sector. One of our clients said just the other day that a loss of the equivalent of just two days of commuting would turn that category upside down. And the ripple effects of that would add to changes affecting every other category. To reiterate, it is not simply a shift from office to home. It is actually a shift from centering your life around the car that gets you to work and to other places to centering your life around the home. I've bulleted many of the second and third order effects that I think will happen. The losses in the red bubble are largely due to the loss of critical mass and the use of a car. The gains in the green bubble are largely due to a new platform or critical mass associated with more time at home. And that's the way to think about it, a shift in platforms and adjacencies that is created by a shift in where you find critical mass. Home will have it and have more of it. Cars will have less of it. Now, so far, most of the debate in the media has been around urban areas versus suburban areas. As you have seen from other kinds of data, like some of the Zillow data just released, there's really no solid evidence yet of a mass urban exodus. But that's the wrong question to begin with. It's not about urban per se. It's about people recentering their lives at home, which can be done anywhere. Critical mass will follow home. So we will see if cities can retain enough of that critical mass to make a go of it when we get to the economic end of the pandemic. And we will get there with three big effects in the marketplace. 
human scale, risk aversion, and hygiene, and that will define the shape of what's new and not new in the marketplace ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, uh, Walker. That was really very interesting. I always find it fascinating, like tying in all the trends from globally kind of to making sense of that. So I do, I do appreciate that, and I do know our, our members appreciate that as well. If there are any questions, you know, please type them in to the um, to the Q and A widget in the Zoom link. But there's something as you were talking that that I've been wondering about, and I'll just maybe start off the questions. Um, this idea, like early on, where you're talking about this familiarity, right? That people in a, in a changing environment, people gravitate towards that. And then, as you talked later about too, this this idea of local also came up in my mind. Like a lot of out of home is local advertising. And do you think you'll you might see a trend of businesses, or you know, maybe we should focus on or look at businesses that are in this kind of familiar local aspect that 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 would, would be some of the this businesses that might be thriving or the brands that might be thriving in kind of this new era yeah um, yeah that's a that's a very good question and 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 one of the things that we have said to many of our global clients is that they need to be sure and deepen their local connections now you know a lot of them have been doing this already but particularly in the context of everything that is going on right now, this kind of local connection is more important than ever. And mm -hmm. certainly I think global brands, you know, to the extent that they are perceived as being global entities, suffer a little bit of a, of a disadvantage in that uh, perception. You know, one of the things that we have seen in the sort of years running up to uh, the start of this pandemic is that big global brands have, have had trouble growing their top lines. They've been very good at growing their bottom lines. Top lines have been different. And a lot of the top line growth that has occurred in many categories has been because of national brands or local brands or more craft oriented brands. So there is a connection there with consumers. And I think we are seeing this pandemic reinforce the value of local, and, and I think we will see that be much more important going forward. Great, yeah, and I think that is definitely interesting and, and good news for, I think, kind of this, this industry, this part of the advertising industry, this idea of local. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, if there are any other, any questions that, that anybody has, we, we do still have a, a few more minutes. I know we're close to the top of the hour, but if there was anything that anybody did have, um, we'd love to, to hear that and maybe we can finish out with one more question or two. Um, Walker, you also mentioned early on that, that you have a webinar coming up um, in, in October. I'd love to uh, share that with everybody and, um, you know, uh, sure. promote that as well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, to do so. Uh, I did a webinar in March, just as the, the pandemic lockdowns were starting. Um, it was originally intended to be a webinar about how politics was going to uh, affect brands this year. It turned into a discussion of how both the pandemic and politics would uh, affect brands and some of the choices brands needed to make. So I, I'm kind of doing the sequel uh, on October 28th. Uh, where we will be taking a second look at the pandemic and some of the deeper effects of the pandemic, as well as what uh, the political environment uh, following the election a week later uh, might mean for brands mm -hmm. as well. So be happy for people to join. Okay. Well, again, um, it doesn't seem like we're having any other questions. And um, I do want to just, again, say thank you and that we thank you. Truly appreciate you doing this uh, session for us again. Like I said, I truly find it um, really interesting uh, to, to hear all those global trends and see what we might be expecting here in the U.S. given what's going on kind of globally. So um, I do, we do appreciate that. I do think there's a lot of great value for all of our members to hear those as well um, to really understand um, you know consumer sentiment and, and things that may be impacting our industry as well so thank you again we truly thank appreciate you. it and i see a lot of chats uh, notes in the chat really affirming that and saying thank you fascinating talk so we, we truly appreciate it so thank you again walker have a great day everyone and thank you for joining